join with me one more time as we pray before we enter into God's Word. Good our God and Father, we give you thanks for your Word. We thank you that you have not left us in darkness, but you have revealed yourself to us in your Word, in your Son, and through your Spirit you have opened our eyes and our hearts to, to see and to understand and to believe in it, to trust in it, to follow it. We just pray that this morning you would continue to open our eyes. You continue to open our ears to hear, our hearts to understand, our minds to understand, our hearts to believe. That we would trust in you. That we would find our confidence in you. And nothing else. That we would boast in this one thing. That we know you. And we trust you. And that you know us. And that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Bless our time together this morning. Fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your confidence. To live lives of obedience, lives of trust. That we might help others do the same. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So this morning, I had all intention of continuing with getting back on track with Ephesians chapter 6. And last night, or well, last, yesterday in the afternoon, a couple weeks ago, Charles gifted to my family a trampoline. Apparently, Owen is too old for jumping the trampoline. It's okay. We'll make use of it. So we put together this trampoline last weekend, but for some reason, I don't know what reason, the cover of the trampoline is it, it's clean, but when you when the kids jumped on it for the first time, they jumped on it for about an hour and a half. It looked like they had gone into a pool. Room. They were covered in black stuff, their, their head to toe. They had just stepped out of the coal mine. So yesterday in the afternoon, I, I went and I was wiping down the trampoline, trying to clean it out. And, and then I, of course, I had to test it out. So I started jumping on it. And I did a flip and I laid on my back. And I'm just laying there and I'm looking at the sky. You know when you lay down, have you ever done this? You lay down in a field or you lay down somewhere flat and you look at the sky. You know, it almost seems like a circle, right? You're looking down and you see it. I was looking up and I was thinking about today, I was, I was thinking about this morning, and it just dawned on me, I was like, uh, he, he who sits above the circle of the earth, right? We have a God who sits on the throne above the circle of the earth. He is the one true king, the king who's above all things. And, and as I was thinking about how last week we prayed for Ukraine and how this week we're praying for Russia and we're taking these these two weeks to, to pray for the situation that's going on overseas and all that's happening with us with Pierce going to the ER and with a bunch of other situations going on in your own everyday lives. It dawned on me, dawned on me that perhaps we should push Ephesians to next week one more time and we should take a little bit of extra time seeking a little bit further about this God, this God who sits above the circle of the earth. You see, the, the thought that comes to your mind when you hear of God is the single most important thing about Him. This morning, Harold, during Sunday school, he mentioned that uh, in his research, he found that an average person makes about 35,000 choices a day. If that's an average person. Some of you are above average. Leanne, you probably make 50,000 choices a <laughs> day. Cut above. 35,000 choices. And what you think about God will affect every single one of those choices. You might not think about it, but it will. What's happening overseas in Eastern Europe right now has everything to do with what the individuals who are there think about God. Every decision you and I make, every whether it's a conscious decision, whether it's an unconscious decision, subconscious decision, what we think about God, what we think about who He is, who He says we are, what He calls us to, affects everything. How we respond to tragedy is affected by what we think who God is. How we respond to times of celebration and joy. How we respond when someone is sick is affected by how we view God. This is the single most important thing about you. So who is this God that we claim 
to worship that we claim to serve. And as I was laying there and looking at the sky, and it came to my mind, the eagle sits above the circles of the earth, and we are like grasshoppers. He's the one that stretched out the heavens like a curtain. He spread the heavens like a tent. He dwells in it. And that, that's from Isaiah chapter 40. And, then, and other thoughts came to my mind. And I was thinking, what, what would be a good place to kind of grasp this big picture of who God is? Because if we have a small view of who God is, then we will have a big view of our problems. But if we have a big view of who God is, then no matter how big our problems are, they're always going to be smaller than God. And God will always be able to work them out. But if we have a tiny view of God, then the slightest problems will always bum us out. It will always get us off track. And so I was thinking, well, where to go? I've said this before, I love the book of Psalms. To me, the Psalms are kind of like, if you were to think of a movie, and you were to think of when you're watching the movie, there is soundtrack music behind the movie. Or if you go to a musical, you go to a live action play, the action is happening on the stage, and underground, the orchestra is playing, giving life and energy and rhythm and beat to what's happening on the stage. Or in the movie, you're watching the scene and there's this song that goes on and it just brings that scene so much to life. Whereas if you were to watch that movie on mute, it would be very different. And I think the Psalms kind of like that. That as you are reading the rest of Scripture and the story of God creating the world and, and man rebelling from Him and God seeking to restore man and making all these promises to Abraham and to Israel and drawing them out of Egypt and then all the way through the Gospels and the Apostles, that the Psalms are providing kind of like this backdrop music, helping fill in the, the, the scene for us, making sense of what oftentimes is hard to explain, giving us the words how to pray when it's a time of difficulty, how to, how to rejoice when it's a time of gladness. The Psalms provide for us the rhythm and the movement, the ins and outs of life. So I love the Psalms. And I've said this before, that the Psalms, we can think of the Psalms kind of the top 150 hits of Israel. Billboard, top 150. And within those 150, the book of Psalms is split up into smaller sections. In fact, into five books. That's how they were carried around, those five scrolls. That's why if you open to Psalm 1, you see their book 1. If you open to Psalm 42, you see book 2, and so on. And within those books, there's even smaller albums, smaller CDs, where you have a collection of five songs or 12 songs. One example is with the Songs of Ascent, where these are 14 songs, Psalm 120 all the way to 134. That's actually... 15. They're songs that the people of Israel would sing to themselves as they're traveling to Jerusalem to the festivals. One of the other collections is where we will be this morning. They are called the Royal Psalms, or the Psalms of Kingship. And it's see, seven, eight psalms that are combined together around this one theme that God is the one true king. There is no one. And along that theme, what we're going to see is this simple truth right here. That, both, that blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. Oftentimes, we'll read that verse. That's actually from Psalm 33. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. But it's very rare, and in fact, I don't think there's ever been a time where the entire nation serves the one true God. There's never been one nation in which the whole nation serves the one true God. It's always people within that nation. And so I decided to translate it like that. Blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. And one more feature to point out to you. Notice how Lord is in all capital letters. Does anybody know why that is? You, you'll see that oftentimes as you read through the Psalms. 
that Lord will be in all capital letters. Sometimes it's in all caps, sometimes it's not. Anybody know why? Seth, you know what? All caps is John Way. Uh, capital L, lowercase O R D is uh, Adonai, so it's his name. That's right, very good. So, so you have this English word, Lord, that's a translation of two different Hebrew words. Whenever you see Lord with a capital L and then a lowercase O R D, that's the word for, that's the title for master, king. It's the Hebrew word Adonai. We would translate it in our common day terms, we would say master, ruler, king, exalted one. And in the, the Bible, we use the word Lord. But whenever you see Lord with all capital letters, what the translators are trying to point you to is that behind that word is the actual name of God. It's the name of the God we serve. If you remember, when Moses was shepherding his sheep and he goes up on this mountain and he sees a bush burning, there's flame, but the actual bush is not being consumed. And he draws near and he hears God speaking to him. And, and the Lord tells Moses to go release his people from Egypt. And Moses does, says this question, when I go, who should I tell them sent me? Which, which God? I mean, the Egyptians have so many gods. He says, the God of your father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I am, has sent you. Tell them that I am has sent you. That's often how it's translated in our Bible. Because the, the Hebrew word there is ye, ye ve, or ye we, depending how you, how you pronounce it, which is the idea of to be. Who is God? God is. He is the one who is. Who's always been, who will always be, he is. And what's his name? Yahweh. The one who is and always was and always will be. Who should I tell? Who should you tell Moses has sent you? Tell them Yahweh has sent you. And over the years, as Hebrew gets translated to Greek and then from, to Latin and to English, it has made its way to our common church lingo as the name Jehovah. And I can explain that to you afterwards if you'd like to. It's, it's kind of interesting. But perhaps you've heard the name Jehovah. That's where it comes from, from this Hebrew word, Yahweh, which is God's personal name. Blessed are the people whose God is Yahweh. And as we saw on Wednesday night, when the apostles are preaching in the temple in Acts chapter 4, they are taking the name of God that he revealed to Moses, and they have substituted in the name Jesus. Because they are trying to get us to understand that the same God who drew, who created the world, the same God who appeared to Moses, to Abraham, to Moses, who led the children out of Israel, out of Egypt, is Jesus. So we can actually, whenever we see all capital letters, L-O-R-D, Lord, we can read Jesus. Blessed are the people whose God is Jesus. Blessed, happy are the people who serve Jesus, whose, whose Lord is Jesus, who have Jesus as their Lord, who recognize that He is the one true God. And no better place than the royal psalms. And so we will begin in Psalm 93. Turn with me to Psalm 93. And we will actually do something somewhat similar to what we did last Sunday. But this time we will be contained in, in the royal psalms, which begins in Psalm 93 and goes all the way to Psalm 100. Psalm 93. And what makes these psalms stand out as this collection of royal psalms is because every single one of them has this phrase, the Lord reigns, Yahweh reigns, Jesus 
reigns. Not anyone else, but Jesus alone. He has always reigned. He is reigning now. He will reign then. And if we do not understand this, then when things happen, like things that are happening in Russia and Ukraine, then we will run the risk of being consumed by fear. If we do not understand that Jesus reigns, and that He is reigning yesterday, He's reigning today, and He will reign tomorrow, then when disease comes, or when my lost, my loved one is taken from me, or when my financial situation is so drastic that I don't know where my next meal is going to come from, if I forget that Jesus reigns, then I will likely fall into despair. But if I remember that He reigns, then I understand that even what the enemy means for evil, the one true God turns it for our good. That even in the valley, He is with us to walk through the valley with us. And so begin with me in Psalm 93. The Lord reigns. Jesus reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on His strength. He has put on strength as His belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting to everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods lift up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. The image of floods there is the idea of anything that rises against God's reign. Could be people, could be situations, could be an actual flood like my hometown in Brazil, where hundreds of people are still are, have died and dozens are still missing. Could be the war overseas. The floods have lifted up. The situation has lifted up, O oh Lord. It seems uncomfortable. Verse 5, verse 4. Mightier than the thunders of many waters. Mightier than the waves of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. You see that? The floods are rising. The floods are rising. They're rising up against you, Lord. But mightier than many the Lord. The Lord on high is mighty. Jesus on high is mighty. Verse 5, your decrees are very trustworthy. Do you believe that? Your decrees, the plans, the purposes that you have for me, that you have for us, they are trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Psalm 94. O oh Lord, God of vengeance. O oh God of vengeance, shine forth. Rise up, O oh judge of the earth. Repay to the proud what they deserve. O oh Lord, how long shall they, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked exult? Don't you feel like saying that sometimes? They pour out their arrogant words. All the evildoers, they boast. They killed the widow. They killed the sojourner. They murdered the fatherless. Don't we feel like that's what's happening? Where these men in power and women in power are using their power to, to corrupt and to destroy and to take from those who have very little so that they can continue to have very much more? Crushing the people. Verse 7. And they say, these evil people, uh, the Lord, Yahweh, Jesus, he does not see. The God of Jacob, he doesn't perceive. Verse 8. Understand, O dullest of people. Fools, when will you be wise? He who planted the ear, does he not hear? In other words, these evil men, these evil people are doing these evil things because they think God doesn't hear. They think God doesn't see. They think there is no God who will bring justice and vengeance. What we think about God affects every 
aspect of our lives. And these people are making the choices they make because they think God doesn't hear. Look at verse 8. Verse 9. He who planted the ear, does he not hear? He who formed the eye, does he not see? He who disciplines the nations, does he not rebuke? He who teaches man knowledge, the Lord, he knows the thoughts of man, that they are above. When we see the floods rising, when we see these nations <coughs> rising, when we see disease rising, when we see difficulties rising, we need to remember this. That from God's perspective, they are nothing but breath, like vapor, like dust in the wind, like that old Kansas song. They are like your foggy breath in a cold winter morning. It seems like something for a while, but phew, vanishes away. He said, is that what we are afraid of? Is that what's causing us so much trouble? Look at verse 12. Blessed is the man whom you discipline, O Lord, whom you teach out of your law to give him rest from days of trouble until a pit is dug for the wicked. You see that those who trust in the Lord have rest even in the midst of trouble. And a day is coming when the wicked will fall into a pit. We believe this. Every thought, every choice we make will be affected by whether or not we believe this. That those who trust in the Lord have rest. And those who rebel against Him will one day fall into the pit. Verse 14. For the Lord will not forsake His people. He will not abandon His heritage. Justice will return to the righteous. All the upright in heart will follow it. Do we believe this, that justice will return? That God will come one day and bring justice? Or will we fall into the bandwagon, like so many in our culture, of either being afraid of everything, or of trying to take matters into their own hands, and sharpening their knives, and stocking up on their ammunition. Do we trust that true justice will come when the Lord comes? That He will bring justice? Verse 16. Notice He says, who, who rises up for me against the wicked? Who stands up for me against evildoers? If the Lord had not been my help, my soul will soon have lived in a land of silence. Did you hear that? When wicked come, when wicked men and wicked people come, when evildoers come, who's on my side? The psalm asks. The Lord is on my side. And in fact, if He wasn't on my side, I wouldn't be here today. And I know many of you can, can say that very same thing. That if the Lord had not been by your side, where would you be today? Not here. Verse 18. When I thought, oh, my foot is slipping, your steadfast love, O Lord, held me up. When the cares of my heart are many, your consolation cheers my soul. Can wicked rulers be allied with you, those who frame injustice by statutes? They band it together against the life of the righteous. They condemn the innocent to death. But the Lord has become my stronghold. My God is the rock of my refuge. He will bring back on them their iniquities. He will wipe them out for their wickedness. The Lord our God will wipe them out. You see that the Lord reigns. He is a God of justice and vengeance. And although these, these wicked people, these evil men, they think they reign, their day will come. He will wipe them away with the breath of His mouth. Like a dandelion. In a spring day, you hold a dandelion up. It seems so, so beautiful. With a simple breath, fades away. That's what the Lord is saying. The wicked, those who oppress, 
those who use their power to abuse the weaker, he will hold them up and blow them away. Psalm 95. Oh, come. How should we respond to this then? How should we respond that Yahweh, that Jesus is king of the universe? Here's how we respond, verse 90, Psalm 95. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God. He is a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. Did you catch that? The depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains, they are his and everything in between, including you and me. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also, verse 5. The sea is his. Why? Because he made it. His hands form the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God. We are the people of His pasture, the sheep of His hand. Today, if you hear His voice, do not hide in your hearts. You see where the psalm now takes a twist? Here is the Lord. He is the King of the universe. Those, the people whose God is the Lord are blessed. Those who turn away from Him will be blown away like dandelions and cease to be. So our response should be what? Come, worship, bow down, trust in Him, follow Him, come with His people. But then He says in verse 7, Today, if you hear His voice, however, do not harden your hearts. Church, as you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts this morning. And he gives an example, just like they did on that day at Massah in the wilderness. If you want the background from that, read in Numbers chapter 14. The people of Israel are being led by Moses in the wilderness, and they are complaining, where's the bread? Oh, manna, I'm tired of this manna. Send me some, some quail. God sends quail. I'm tired of this quail. We're thirsty. Give us some water. And God gives water. And then they finally make it to the edge of the promised land. And God says, go. The land is yours. And they send 12 spies in. The spies come back with, with massive amounts of fruit and goods from the land, saying, the land is good. But 10 of the spies say, well, we can't go in. The people in there are too strong. We will never make it. We're like grasshoppers to them. We should actually go back to Egypt. And so they raise up leaders to take them back to Egypt. They hardened their hearts on that day. And the psalmist is saying, don't be like them. But when you stand in the face of the promise, in the face of the trouble, don't fail to trust. The same God that provided the bread back then. The same God that provided the water. The same God that brought the quail. The same God that walked with you all, these, all this time. Who gave you light in the night. Who gave you a cloud for the day to cover you. That same God will walk with you. When the day of difficulty comes, don't harden your hearts like they did. Because notice the consequence. Verse 9. When your fathers, they put me to the test... They put me to the proof, even though they had seen my work. For 40 years, I loathed that generation. And I said, they are a people who go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Therefore, I, it's the Lord, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. In Psalm 94, he had said that those who trust in the Lord have rest. But those who fail to trust here we see will not enter the rest. The Lord reigns. The people who have Him as Lord, who serve Him, are blessed and find rest. But those who harden their hearts give up rest. And he continues, verse Psalm 96, O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. 
Here's our response. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless His name. Tell of His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the nations. His marvelous works among the peoples. For the Lord. For great is the Lord. And greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. Even the kings of this world who make themselves out to be gods. The Lord is above all of them. Verse 5, for all the gods of the people, they are worthless idols. But the Lord, He made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before Him. Strength and beauty are in His sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the earth. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory that's due His name. Bring an offering. Come into His courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before Him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord, Yahweh, Jesus, He reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples in equity. Let the heavens be glad. Let the earth rejoice. Let the field exult. Let everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. Why? Because He comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and He will judge the peoples in faithfulness. Notice, we are called to rejoice and be glad. Why? Not because He's going to come and pat everyone on the back. Saying, it's okay, I'm going to leave it your best. We rejoice and we are glad because when He comes, He is going to judge. And you might think, I don't see how that's, I don't see how that leads to me being happy. And this is what we have to remember. The idea of judgment is like a coin that has two sides. Normally, when we think of judgment, we think of the negative side. He's going to come and punish all the evildoers. But judgment, although it has that, and that's true, it also has a positive side. That when he comes as a good judge, he is going to punish all evildoers, but he is going to bless all those who are trusting him. He's going to honor them. He's going to reward them. He is going to vindicate them. Imagine, the picture here is, imagine you lived in a small rural village, small rural town, that has been taken over by bandits. We're in the West here. Bandits have come in and have taken over the town. And there's nothing you and I can do. They are taking all our supplies. They're oppressing us. They're taking everything that is rightfully ours and they're using for themselves. They're even taking some of our own family members and abusing them and hurting them and killing them. And there's nothing you and I can do. We're in a small little town. They have power. They have us. But then, in the distance, we see smoke rising. We see, we see dust rising. And it's a caravan. And we realize it's the king. The king is coming. What do you think the people in that village will feel to know that the king is coming? To rid that village of the bandits. To bring justice, to bring righteousness and rule and good order to this land. They will rejoice. They will sing for joy. And the bandits will do what? Run in fear. That's the image here. When God comes to judge, we look for that day with joy and gladness because He is going to rid this world of evil and He is going to bring in goodness and righteousness and peace. He is our hope. And continue with me, Psalm 97. The Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him, burning up all his adversaries. His lightnings, they light up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains, they melt like wax before the Lord. Before the Lord of all the earth. 
the heavens proclaim his righteousness. All the peoples see his glory. All worshippers of image are put to shame. All who make their boast in worthless idols, including the people who trust the gods of this world. Worship him, O you gods. And Zion, the city of God, hears and is glad. And the daughters of Judah, they rejoice because of your judgments, O Lord. For you, O Lord, you are most high above all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. You who love the Lord, O oh, you hate evil. He preserves the lives of his saints. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous, righteous, and joy for the upright in hell. Rejoice in the Lord, O oh righteous. Give thanks to His holy name. Church, rejoice in the Lord. Put your confidence in Him. Not in what this politician is going to do. Not in what this person is going to say he's going to do. Not in whether or not your financial situation is going to stay up. Not in whether or not the sickness is going to heal. Put your joy, put your confidence in the Lord. He alone can walk with us through the valley of the shadow of death and on the other side. Psalm 98. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. For he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm, they have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth in joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy before the Lord because He comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and He will judge the peoples with equity. Psalm 99. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned above the cherubim. Those are angels. Let the earth quake. The Lord and He alone is great in Zion. He is exalted over all peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is He. The King in His might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at His footstool. Holy is He. Moses and Aaron, they were among His priests. Samuel also was among those who called upon His name. They called to the Lord, and He answered them. And we can say that of us here. We call to the Lord, and He answered us. Verse 7, In the pillar of the cloud He spoke to them. They kept His testimonies and the statutes that He gave to them. O oh Lord our God, You answered them. You were a forgiving God to them. Or an avenger of their wrongdoings. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. And then this section ends with Psalm 100 as a summarizing point. How then do we respond? How then do we go on from here? How do we respond when, when it seems like war, perhaps, my world war might break out over again? How do we respond when another pandemic perhaps arrives right around the corner? How do we respond when, when the floor beneath us seems to drop? Or the walls around us seem to crush us? If we trust that the Lord reigns, then this is how we respond. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with thanksgiving, with singing, 
I can bet you this, that even if World War III rises, the church will not stop gathering. Even if we have to go into the woods, we will gather, we will sing. Even if war breaks out around us, His people will not stop proclaiming His name. Will you be there with us? Verse 3, Know that the Lord, that Jesus, that Yahweh, He is God. It is He who made us. We are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name. For the Lord, Yahweh, Jesus, is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And His faithfulness to all generations. Blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord our God and Father, we give you thanks. You alone reign on God. There is no other. And we come here in this presence acknowledging that we often fall. And we come in your presence Acknowledging that we often fall short of recognizing this. We often lift up and raise up other gods in our life, other sources of strength and support. They all fail. Time and time again, they disappoint. Turn our hearts to you. We are so prone to wonder, prone to leave God we love. Take our heart, Lord. Take it and seal it. Seal it for your courts alone. We would trust him. We'd sing praises knowing that you reign. You reigned yesterday. You reign today. You reign tomorrow. From this day on. 